The Book of Disquiet by Fernando Pessoa Number 26 To give each emotion a personality, a heart to each state of the heart. The girls came around the bend in a large group. They sang as they walked, and the sound of their voices was happy. I don't know who or what they might be. I listened to them for a time from afar, without a feeling of my own, but a feeling of sorrow for them impressed itself on my heart. For their future? For their unconsciousness? Hmm, not directly for them, and perhaps, after all, only for me. Number 27. Literature, which is art married to thought, and realization untainted by reality, seems to me the end towards which all human efforts would have to strive, if it were truly human, and not just a welling up of our own animal self. To express something is to conserve its virtue and take away its terror. Fields are greener in their description than in their actual greenness. Flowers, if described with phrases that define them in the air of the imagination, will have colors with a durability not found in cellular life. What moves, lives. What is said, endures. There's nothing in life that's less real for having been well described. Small-minded critics point out that such and such poem with its protracted cadences in the end says merely that it's a nice day. But to say it's a nice day is difficult. And the nice day itself passes on. It is up to us to conserve the nice day in a wordy, florid memory, sprinkling new flowers and new stars over the fields and skies of the empty, fleeting outer world. Everything is what we are, and everything will be for those who come after us in the diversity of time what we will have intensely imagined. What we, that is, by embodying our imagination, will have actually been. The grand, tarnished panorama of history amounts, as I see it, to a flow of interpretations, a confused consensus of unreliable eyewitness accounts. The novelist is all of us, and we narrate whenever we see, because seeing is complex, like everything. Right now, I have so many fundamental thoughts, so many truly metaphysical things to say that I suddenly feel tired, and I've decided to write no more think no more. I'll let the fever of saying put me to sleep instead, and with closed eyes I'll stroke, as if petting a cat, all that I might have said. Number 28. A breath of music, or of a dream, of something that would make me almost feel, something that would make me not think. Number 29. After the last drops of rain began to fall more slowly from the rooftops and the sky's blue began to spread over the street's paving stones, then the vehicles sang a different song, louder and happier, and windows could be heard opening up to the no longer forgetful sun. From the narrow street at the end of the next block came the loud invitation of the first seller of lottery tickets, and nails being nailed into crates in the shop opposite reverberated in the limpid space. It was an ambiguous holiday, official but not strictly observed. Work and repose coexisted, and I had nothing to do. I'd woken up early, and I took a long time getting ready to exist. I paced from one side of the room to the other, dreaming out loud incoherent and impossible things. Deeds I'd forgotten to do, hopeless ambitions haphazardly realized, fluid and lively conversations which, were they to be, would already have been. And in this reverie, without grandeur or calm, in this hopeless and endless dallying, I paced away my free morning and my words, said out loud in a low voice, multiplied in the echoing cloister of my inglorious isolation. 
Seen from the outside, my human figure was ridiculous, like everything human in its intimacy. Over the pajamas of my abandoned sleep, I'd put on an old overcoat, habitually employed for these morning vigils. My old slippers were falling apart, especially the left one. And with my hands in the pockets of my posthumous coat, I strolled down the avenue of my small room in broad and decisive steps, playing out in my useless reverie a dream no different from anybody else's. Through the open coolness of my only window, thick drops of leftover rain could still be heard falling from the rooftops. It was still somewhat moist and cool from having rained. The sky, however, was triumphantly blue, and the clouds that remained from the defeated or tired rain retreated behind the castle, surrendering to the sky its rifled paths. It was an occasion to be happy, but something weighed on me, some inscrutable yearning, an indefinable and perhaps even noble desire. Perhaps it was just taking me a long time to feel alive. And when I leaned out my high window, looking down at the street I couldn't see, I suddenly felt like one of those damp rags used for house cleaning that are taken to the window to dry but are forgotten, balled up on the sill where they slowly leave a stain. 30. Sadly, or perhaps not, I recognize that I have an arid heart an adjective matters more to me than the real weeping of a human soul, my master Viera. But sometimes I'm different. Sometimes I have the warm tears of those who don't have and never had a mother, and the eyes that burn with these dead tears burn inside my heart. I don't remember my mother. She died when I was one year old. My distracted and callous sensibility comes from the lack of that warmth and from my useless longing after kisses I don't remember. I'm artificial. It was always against strange breasts that I woke up, cuddled as if by proxy. Uh, it's my longing for whom I might have been that distracts and torments me. Who would I be now if... I'd receive the affection that comes from the womb and is placed through kisses on a baby's face. Perhaps my regret for having never been a son plays a large role in my emotional indifference. Whoever held me as a child against her face couldn't hold me against her heart. Only she who was far away in a tomb could have done that. She who would have belonged to me had fate willed it. They told me later on that my mother was pretty, and they say that when they told me, I made no comment. I was already fit in body and soul, but ignorant about emotions, and people's speech was not yet news from other hard-to-imagine pages. My father, who lived far away, killed himself when I was three, and so I never met him. I still don't know why he lived far away. I never cared to find out. I remember his death as a grave silence during the first meals we ate after learning about it. I remember that the others would occasionally look at me, and I would look back, dumbly comprehending. Then I'd eat with more concentration, since they might when I wasn't looking still be looking at me. I'm all of these things, like it or not, in the confused depths of my fatal sensibility.